Good evening, everyone. We'll give it another minute. Let everybody fall up in here. Thank you for sharing your evening with us. We have a lot to talk about tonight. I'm so excited about this. I may just start because I have a little intro and that way people can still be coming in while I do my intro. We can jump right into the introductions and questions and things like that. I wanna welcome everyone to Tea with an MD and I'm your, co your host, Dr. T, owner of Two Edify LLC and VIP Wellness Tea, whose mission is dedicated to social justice and equity in healthcare and bringing healing to communities through empowerment, education and edification. I am honored, honored, honored to host today's webinar, Fit for a King, a discussion of Black men's health. Today I'll be sipping on, you know, I always have my little tea, royal tea, which is the Black men's health um, wellness tea, but certainly can be enjoyed by a woman as well. And you can go to the website, VIP Wellness Tea for more info. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our panel for tonight. We have a, a packed and wonderful, amazing schedule. And I want to start off by saying how grateful I am um, and proud of my brothers. You know, we connected through our educational journeys. Three of us, I went to under three of them. I went to undergrad with Dwayne, John, um, and Joseph at, at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And Dr. Philip Murray, we attended Harvard together with the Health Policy Fellowship, Minority Health Policy Fellowship, and that's how our roles connected. And I just want to thank you for being here, gentlemen, and we'll get started. So one of the things I wanted to do is just take a quick moment. You know, people are still falling in and, you know, there's been a lot going on in the world. Usually I do this um, time just to kind of breathe and level set, but I just want to take a moment of silence and recognition of the tragedies and everything that's been going on, um, how it's impacting our communities, certainly from someone who lives in Minneapolis, I just feel like it's just been um, one thing after another all over the world. And just, you can pause, you can sit in silence, however you wanna honor this time and honor the families and people and friends that are affected by the recent tragedies. I ask you to do that now. Right, thank you. So we'll hopefully you bought your, your minds ready and set and open to receive some knowledge for tonight. I'm gonna to start off with introductions. We're gonna start with Mr. Dwayne B. Davis, who is in his 26th year as an educator in Chicago. After completing his undergraduate degree in English at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, he began the Teachers for Chicago program his first assignment was as an eighth grade reading and math teacher at Walter H. Diet, I'm probably not saying it right, middle school while attending Columbia College for a master in the art of teaching. He also completed a master's in English at Loyola University, Chicago. His next teaching position was at Pershing Elementary School, followed by teaching English at Whitney Young High School. Duane left Chicago Public Schools for a tenure track position at City Colleges of Chicago, and has spent the last 20 plus years teaching, leading, coaching, and consulting at a variety of schools and organizations in Chicago and nationally. He is currently the executive director of K-12 education initiatives at the University of Chicago and writing his dissertation for a PhD in curriculum and instruction from the University of Illinois at Chicago with a focus on early career teachers. Welcome Dwayne. Well, thank you and glad to be here with everyone and uh, great to see you uh, after, I don't know, it's been 27 years since I've seen you to me go live and in person. So just good to see you. Thank like, you. don't crack, like, don't crack. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I want, I'm going to ask all you guys this, but really quick, I think women do really good about talking about self-care. So kind of your opening question is, what's one thing you do to take care of yourself? Um, I... The whole time the pandemic's happened, I make sure to try to work out every single day in some way, shape or form. It's actually been my version of therapy 
not, I should also going to see a mental health care professional, but like going to working out, scheduling that, making sure I take my walks, drink my water and, and get some exercise in. It's just super important for, for my managing my self care. It's, it's the thing that I do every day that, that makes, makes me start my day and also sometimes in my day as well. There you go. Wonderful. Thanks, Dwayne. So next I have Dr. John Major Eason. He's a senior fellow and equity scholar at the Urban Institute and an associate professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He is the author of Big House on the Prairie, Rise of the Rural Ghetto and Prison Proliferation. <laughs> he is founder and director of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Justice Lab and also a founding member of the UW Pancreas Cancer Data Group. He recently served as a member of the University at Buffalo's inaugural Center for Diversity Innovations Distinguished Visiting Scholar cohort. He is a mixed methods researcher specializing in ethnography and rare events and research interests in health disparities, punishment, and race across rural urban communities. Before, before receiving an MPP and PhD from the University of Chicago, he worked as a congregation-based community organizer, focusing on housing and criminal justice issues and served as a political organizer, most notably for then Illinois State Senator Barack Obama. Welcome, Dr. Eason. And what's one of your self-care practices? Thank you for putting this together, Dr. Foster. Uh, I think that was Granita in the chat. I don't know if we should be uh, shouting out the people there, but my main self-care self -care, uh, practice is yoga and second to that is CrossFit. Wonderful. Short and sweet. I'm another yoga person as well. So next we have Dr. Philip Murray. Dr. Murray is a physician leader currently working in adult and child psychiatry as the director of emergency psychiatry at UC Davis. He has an interest in health systems and innovations focused on vulnerable populations. He obtained his MPH in health management from Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health through the Commonwealth Fund Mongan Fellowship in Minority Health Policy. His practicum focused on ways to expand behavioral health services for large health systems. Prior to that, he completed a chief residency in child and adolescent psychiatry at the New York Presbyterian Hospital Child and Adolescent Program of Columbia and Cornell University's New York, New York. Medical degree from Medical College of Georgia, Augusta, and adult psychiatry residency at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Murray is committed to expanding the workforce for underrepresented populations through education and advocacy at all levels. Welcome, Dr. Murray. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it is an absolute pleasure to be here. I'm honored that you thought to invite me. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the discussion tonight. Uh, as far as the self-care thing, yes, exercise, but also I'm intentional in taking rest. Uh, so I will also watch a decent amount of television or movies. Um, you know, not like the nightly binge where it impedes on rest time, but you know, sometimes you got to give yourself permission to just chill. And I lean into that as much as I can when it's appropriate. All right, I hear that. All right, next we have Dr. Joseph West. Dr. West is the Executive Vice President of Business Innovations and Solutions at Clinify Health and a Voluntary Assistant Professor at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine's Department of Public Health Sciences and a senior research consultant for the Florida Institute for Health Innovation. He has an extensive background and expertise in epidemiology, population health, and data analytics, specifically spearheading work impacting health equity and the elimination of health disparities. Before joining the Miller School of Medicine, Dr. West was a founding member and chief population health officer for Next Level Health Illinois, which is a Medicaid health maintenance organization. Dr. West graduated from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health with a Master of Science and Doctor of Science, Social and Behavioral Sciences, and from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with a Bachelor of Science in Sociology. Welcome, Dr. West. Good evening. Thank you. It is great to see you. Great to see you. I think the last time I saw you, we were promoting your, your book. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> It was great. So welcome. Um, I mean, thank you for, for having me. And as far as what I do for self-care is one, I, I still burn incense and meditate. I have a really good book called Streams in the Desert and try to do those daily meditations. And 
And then Curtis Mayfield and James Brown. I don't go a day without some soul music and dancing. Man. I mean, without Curtis Mayfield, I think we all be crazy. But yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. <clears throat> I love right. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm saying. I hear you. That's awesome. So thank you. So we're gonna jump right in. Thank you for those introductions. Um, and I want to shout out Dr. Eleanor Seaton for linking us, you know, saying, hey, this is who you need to have on this panel. So shout out to um Dr. Eleanor Seaton, my last sisters from the U, you representing. So as we know, the crisis of Black men's health requires urgent attention. Um, initiatives such as the Black Men's Health Project are bringing greater awareness to this issue and this disparity. However, we certainly have a lot more work to do. Um, this webinar will focus on multiple factors as it relates to identifying strategies, health inequities, and also ways to mitigate and ele elevate the whole person. And for me, as a Black woman, um, one of the things I feel we need to be more um, mindful of is just being inclusive in our conversations. Um, sometimes we have our women stuff here, men stuff here, but the health of men affects our health. I know for me, it does. I have brothers, I have uncles, I have dads, you know that. So it, it all affects all of us in our community. So it definitely needs to be um, a priority. So speaking of which, I wanna kind of just kick off with your first reaction to the topic what does it mean for you to be well or fit? And what's one critical issue that should be addressed as it relates to Black men's health? And I'll start with Dwayne with that. Yeah, I, you know, uh, there are multitudes, you know, multitudes of ways of looking at that. And for me, just the, the, the title of this webinar this evening, um, just first had me centered on, especially with the recent events and the pandemic, it's, it's just everybody's mental health, right? Just the, and, and the saying the health as well. I literally text that to like three people today, <laughs> uh, just in, that, in my interactions with folks, trying to get them to just be conscientious of things they need to co consider and take care of as we try to take care of the village. So um, uh, that to me is, is just like, how do we connect um, the idea of wellness and to not be uh, reactive, but be proactive, right? So um, it's not just your, your, you know, your family care physician. It's not just your wellness visits for your children. It's also the environment that you're growing up in. It's your community and how that impacts you, your access to open spaces and, and healthy spaces and healthy meals, all of the things that go into um, just being having the opportunity to be fully you uh, grow and develop and your brain to grow and develop. Um, and with that, to me, as, as the as the as the K 12 person kind of in the space, um, I think one of the things that has been revealed uncovered, I would say during during this pandemic, is that schools primary function is care and service, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, kids can't get shots because or they don't have to get because they're not in school. Oh, kids can't get physicals. <laughs> because they're not in school. Oh, kids aren't able to get their social worker and their other services and mental health services because that flows through the school space. And when we were in at home for many months, that wasn't able to get to young people. And, and that, that being a serious issue. Now, it doesn't mean the schools were all the healthiest spaces, right? It just means that's where the care was. Because I also think for our children and for black boys in particular, Schools are places of trauma. Schools are places where you're not affirmed. Schools are places where you don't see a teacher that looks like you. So you don't see that as a possibility. So I think that also impacts the black male teacher pipeline in that way. So, uh, you know, you pull one thread and the whole thing unravels. Um, and so schools being centers for care more and, and community more so than anything else. The reading, writing, science, social studies is important. But really what's important is your community with somebody an adult is checking on you and your family and you get the opportunity to be in community, hopefully, if you're in a good to decent school, but but that they're not always the best places, but that's where the primary point of care is for people ages four through, through 18. You're, and you're right on with that. And as a um, trained, as a pediatrician, I recognize and, and appreciate the role that schools play in the health and well-being of children. So thank you for that. Um, speaking of, you kind of alluded to mental health as being a, a key and important priority right now. Dr. Mori, same question for you. What do you see as a health priority for Black men and what does it mean to be well? So it's interesting because when you say health priority, like I can't really pick one, 
Uh, I mean, I think if anything, the priority should be that health is a priority. I think a lot of times when it comes down to it, when we look at this narrative of being men and especially black men, there are so many things that we don't have time for. Uh, there are so many things that we're allowed to put by the wayside and just allowed to kind of fall to the back burner. And I think this idea that it's very twisted and it's not clearly articulated, but what's implied is it's almost more manly to be less healthy you know, like men don't take time to involve themselves with self-care or involve themselves with, you know, feelings or pain or whatever else. You know, we all kind of find ways to cope. Some are good and some are bad. Uh, but the idea that you can just kind of move on beyond that, it's just false. And it's something that is just damaging us even more than environmental, structural and social things are damaging us. And so I think, you know, it's one of those things where we have to say like, hey, Yes, the world is harder for a variety of factors that we're not in control of, but that doesn't mean that we have to help it take us down. You know, it is okay to make that stand for little things like taking those breaks, like expressing yourself, like, you know, coming up with loving relationships and affirming each other in other ways to where we don't kind of have to accept the default things that make it difficult. Uh, we can kind of stand in ways that aren't always viewed as violent per se, but are also not viewed as passive either. Love it. Right on point. What about you, Dr. Eason? What are your thoughts about that? I think um, th that the, I agree with everything that both uh, Duane and, and Philip, Dr. Murray have said. Uh, I think that health being prioritized uh, is more of a challenge for some people than others. And I, I just don't mean black folks generally or black men specifically. I, I think it's uh, based on where you live. A lot of it's based on where you live, and I'm not even talking necessarily about necessarily like if if you live like in uh, a major metropolitan center, right? Uh, I focus on rural communities as well, um, and one of the major impediments to uh, healthcare is access. So it's not just about your individual cultural um, responses or lack thereof. Um, I think one of the major stressors for us uh, re responding directly uh, and affirming some of what's already been said is that uh, black men in particular, uh, um, we, we tend to go into John Henryism, right? We're gonna do everything. So there's the response to do nothing or we're gonna do everything. And you can't really, um, you really can't work through everything and uh, sort of walk it off. That's the whole mentality, the type of uh, masculinity that we've been taught. But that's that's a cultural response that's directly uh, related to uh, structural racism and white supremacy that we face every day. Uh, and while it can be good when you're young, it may get you out of some tough situations when you're young as we begin to age at different points in the life course, it becomes that default strategy is actually uh, self-defeating and works against you. Um, so if I had one thing to really add here, um, sum up everything that's sort of been articulated already, I would really focus on stress and stress and our uh, ability or inability to cope with it and handle it. Um, and what are the tools available for us to deal with stress. So um, I'm hoping that we, we can have some chat. Uh, I, I can learn from other folks who have more expertise as MDs on this panel. Uh, I hope that we get a chance to chat about that. Wonderful, absolutely. Dr. West, how about you jump in and answer that? Yeah, I mean, we can digest a lot here, but I think for me, what what what's, uh, it's two, two groups that are most that, that I'm most concerned with. And that is when we had our Medicaid health plan um, and I'm still, we're still working a lot in Medicaid, but we saw in Illinois that black men in Cook County uh, aged into disability faster than any other group, right? We can predict when they were aging into disability. We had the same data that let's say Fresenius or any of these dialysis centers had. And it was interesting how they could pattern and predict who was going to end up in dialysis by looking at obesity rates in children in their fourth grade and zip codes, right? Because when they're obese um, or those, you know, those BMIs are really high, 
so when you look at where they're building dialysis centers in the black community, um, they're overlapping with those obesity rates in children. What's disturbing also is that we recently, and I know that our program officer is on, we did a study recently uh, called Healthy Adaptive Behaviors, a community study on trauma um, in young men uh, across, the, across the South. And in those interviews, what we saw was that, you know, half of them had reported, you know, now these are young men between the ages of 18 and 30, had reported struggling with their, their self-identity, their sexuality, half had reported having three or more adverse childhood events. In the past 12 months, they had said that they had felt so sad, hopeless, and depressed and or down more than a third that they could not do normal usual activities. Others have, during focus groups, asked questions about what am I supposed to be, right? If I say I'm a male or a man, is that antiquated? You know, there were rites, rituals, pathways by which there were marks to say, hey, this is your pathway to manhood. This is what manhood means. Now they say that they don't know, you know, there's, there's no structure in, in that way to, to support them. You know, we had Black men that had Medicaid, right? They had medical cards. We worked with uh, insurance companies to get those Black men medical cards. What we saw is that we had no doctors that wanted to see them, right? So they had, a, they had an insurance card. What they didn't have was the access. So now in our conversations right now with, with community health centers, we're conducting a series of conversations across the state of Florida and across the South again, Robert Wood Johnson, on Medicaid access and community health centers. And we're asking people who qualify for Medicaid how people are treating them. What's heartbreaking is that we know how some people are treated based on class and race. But what's really heartbreaking is how they say Black people treat them and they're Black. Mm -hmm. And that how black people deny them and or treat them or think that they're trying to get over this, that, and the other. So we're working with community health centers to really think through what that means for their staff. But when you're a black man and you go to a community health center and there's a black woman there, another person there, and then they treat you bad, like what are you doing here? You're a criminal, this, that, and the other. You're, you're black Medicaid is for women and children. There's no man that's supposed to be here if you got Medicaid. You got to find somewhere else to go. Um, and so with that, so now my only option is then the ED or, and or, 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 or that emergency care. So and I'll, I'll stop there, but that is what's, what's bothering us right now. And, and what's really standing out, and I, I'm really interested in the brother's take on this, because it's been painful in these focus groups with these young men that say, hey, I committed to a crime or something when I was 13, 14, 15 years old. I'm 18, I'm 20, I'm 21 years old, but it was on Facebook, it was on social media, whatever. Now I'm trying to change my life, get on with my life. Everybody want to talk about what I used to be, mm. what used to, well, how I used to be. You know, I can't get past that because the system won't let me pass it because I'm still on probation, parole, and no justice involved. But the people who are supposed to be around me, they ain't letting me pass it. So where, how do I repair? Where's my restoration? And then what's my path? And, and you said the key word, and I'm going to, my role, I really want to listen. I want to take this in. Uh, maybe, John, if you can speak more to that, because I know you do a lot of work as it relates to that. Um, can you speak on that? Well, there's, uh, there's a lot of different ways to, uh, I, I think uh, Dr. West gave us a lot to chew on, um, it, but there's a lot of different ways to look at that. But I think the focal point that he touched on uh, is um, what my what my good friend and colleague Ruben Miller talks about uh, is the afterlife of mass incarceration, um, where there you know we we often focus on the two million plus people who are in prison and jails, but we don't talk about the uh, tens of millions who are on who are under state supervision, mass parole mass supervision, right? We don't talk about those folks. Uh, and we, we often don't even realize this isn't just a black problem. Six in 10 Americans know someone or has a family member who's incarcerated. It just so happens that it's between uh, eight and 10 black people who know someone uh, who's incarcerated or has, or, or has a family member incarcerated. So if you look at the reach at a criminal, justice or criminal legal system, because there's no justice in it. Um, and if you look at places like Cook County, for example, 
which uh, the Cook County Jail is the largest mental health provider in the country, right? The fact that we're using, uh, Dwayne talked about using how schools were ostensibly a social service agency. Uh, for some people, uh, another part of the state, uh, the prison itself has become a social service agency. And um, I don't think that's the best place where you should get mental health. There was actually a study showing that pre-Obamacare, uh, you could, uh, black folks, poor black folks on average could uh, possibly receive better health care after being incarcerated or while being incarcerated than out in the free world. So that should tell you about just the access to health care that, uh, that Dr. West, that's just another way of getting at that. Um, but I think there's a lot of things we can do. Um, there's a lot of ways we can start to chip at the edges of this. And it has to start at us, start with us thinking um, above this being an individual problem, right? Uh, a lot of studies, a lot of uh, research, we focus on individuals and individual behaviors. Yeah, people have agency, but most of our opportunities are constrained at the uh, institutional and community level. So I wanna have us think, or think about this on multiple levels, not just the problems, uh, being an individual problem, but assessing the problem and, and not blaming it on you know, far off structures and institutions, but assessing where interventions and policies can best be, uh, best, uh, best come into uh, make the biggest difference. Ooh, Tamiko, if I can jump in, because that I literally recently just had a conversation with somebody about um, this CDC study they found about black fathers being more engaged than people think. And, and, um, and this person is, is doing some research and write, writing a piece for the Washington Post, I think that's going to appear on Father's Day. And it was one of those questions like, tell me about this related to schools like this study says black men are helping their kids with homework more than any other fathers you know in this particular study and i i, I went scholarly quickly then i just shifted that off and talked about being a parent and then talked about being an educator right i was like well how many people did they interview and what they're like okay let's just let's just take the numbers as is like you see that and what's your reaction and what does that look like in schools and i said well schools are not welcoming spaces for for fathers right they're not welcoming spaces for families like, like so so they're not sometimes they're not welcome in spaces for families um that is it's, it varies per community per school per instructional leader in that school then it's how do we get parents to engage how do we get fathers to engage are we intentional about engaging fathers in that way so i just wanted to jump in on that individual agency piece which is there are a lot of people fathering <laughs> Uh, young people all over the place. They're not their biological father. They might be an uncle. They might be a family friend. They stand in, they stand in the gap in that way. And that, that that's a lot of the way that the community engages and takes a collective responsibility for our young people. And, and it's, it's everybody you call uncle that's not really your uncle. That's not your, you know, that's not your relative, but they are uncle. And since they are uncle, you treat them with a level of respect. They're supporting you in a certain way and you get that support outside of the institution. And a lot of that's because the institution is not responding. And we know that. And it doesn't take like a, it doesn't take all of the credits and degrees on this in, on this webinar to know that, right? Your, your uncle knows that they never graduated from high school. They got their GED. They know the system doesn't respond that way. So then we have to respond individually. And I've thought about this during the pandemic a lot. I think there are a lot of communities that did, I'm gonna say relatively well during a pandemic because they connected with their local church, they were active at their local school, they had built a network before the crisis in order to support each other. So they were able to support each other during a crisis. And my, my, my constant conversation with people is, if I didn't trust you before the pandemic, why would I trust you during the pandemic? If I didn't trust your numbers before the pandemic, why would I trust your numbers during the pandemic? Like, you a liar then, you a liar now. So why would I work with you? Why would I believe you're gonna you know, help me out? Because the people that have been helping me have been here since before then. So I just want to jump in on an individual agency uh, to think about that, not to you know, uh, alleviate blame, but to think, of, to think about the positive things that are happening and how do we capitalize on that and react to that. Absolutely. And I think that point of individual agency and the whole um, 
as a medical provider, being a part of the system, the whole issue of trust and what does trust mean? You know, and, and some people speak of a three component part of trust, which is the empathy um, logic, which I never really thought much about logic as it relates to trust and being able to be authentic. So like, as you say, if you are authentic and someone who I connected with prior, how then am I a trusted messenger in a time of a crisis? So I think that was a very um, good point and thanks for bringing that up. So um, we kind of started getting down the road of the mental health. I wanna bring um, Dr. Murray back in as it relates to that and just your role um, in therapy and seeking. We talked, Dr. West talked about access to care and we know that's a huge issue even for people who aren't on Medicaid, just being able to have quality access to care and especially quality access to behavioral and mental health care. So if we're not able to access providers, and maybe you gentlemen can speak more on that, but most of the data that I understand is that most Black men want to see Black um, health providers, especially mental health providers. So we continue to filter and probably make it a, a less and less chance that they're actually going to be able to have that kind of care that they desire to receive. So with that lack of racial concordance, with that lower um, access rates, what are other ways that people can be creative about accessing or um, their mental health needs? So, I mean, I guess one, what I want to highlight is when it comes to mental health needs and things like that, there is formal treatment and then there's addressing your mental health needs. And I think a lot of times we conflate the two and we basically say that if you're not seeing a therapist, you're not taking care of your mental health needs. But if we take a step back, each panelist talked about ways that we address our mental health. Uh, and I think a lot of times we get into, I guess you'd say mental disorder and mental illness and not really talk about the things that go into wellness. Uh, and so I think a lot of that are gonna be the things that I think a lot of people either take for granted that they have or take for granted or just kind of minimize that they don't have. So that's going to be, you know, the basic stuff, the good diet, the exercise, the sleep, all of those things. Uh, but then there are the things on top of that that you do as far as those that you surround yourself with, uh, those that you go to for support, those you go to during the uh, difficult times. And then there's the things that you do and you don't do. Like you don't drink too much. You don't smoke too much. You know, you stay away from drugs. And that's why when I started off, I wanted to highlight everybody has a way to cope. It's just certain ways are helpful and certain ways are not helpful. And the unfortunate thing is what is socially appropriate for all men is are usually behaviors that are not helpful. It is way more appropriate for you to be violent rather than sad. You know, it's way more for you to be angry rather than vulnerable. And that's something that we program people from a very young age. Dr. Davis, I'm certain you see it with the families that you deal with, you know, oh, stop all that crime, be a man. You know, that is perpetuated moving forward. And unfortunately, the narrative of masculinity, at least in this country, is going to be attached to aggression. And that's what we encourage. And that is what we cultivate. And so I think when it comes to wellness, I think finding those spaces where you can be softer and basically where you can be safe and really experience the totality of emotion, uh, that's something that is not attached to the larger male narrative. And I think it's even less for Black men because there are so many circumstances that force us to be hard. Um, and all of you, you know, some of you guys were talking about raising your kids beforehand. Some of you have black boys. You know, it's hard to balance that where you want to protect that innocence, but you also realize that socially, at least within this country, that innocence is not protected the same way it is for other people's kids. And so that's something that we kind of have to balance. And this is all just the default stuff. You know, this isn't people who require treatment, who have a diagnosis or whatever else. So I think in cultivating those spaces, not just within the family, but whether it's the community, there are initiatives that go with churches, that go with barbershops. There are things that are attached to schools. There are, I think people are trying to get around to it when it comes to work and things like that. I think those are the things that really go into this idea of wellness. And when it goes to the idea of care, Unfortunately, there are just not enough Black providers for every Black person that wants one. And so I think that's where we get into these concepts of cultural competency, cultural humility, and things like that. I personally have seen different therapists over the years. Lucked out first time, got an older Black woman. We were rocking. It was good. The next two have been white people, and they have been just fine. And what I want to highlight is when 
when it comes down to it, even though it might not be exactly what you want, when the opposite is you're just continuing to deal with issues all by yourself and they get worse, sometimes we have to compromise a little bit. Now, the other part is I think I'm a different type of patient because as a mental health provider, I probably feel a little bit better giving my therapist a little bit more guidance. But I think so many times we're used to things just happening to us as Black people you can shop around. You know, if it's not a good fit, that's not the end all be all. Now, to Dr. Eason's point, when you have a literal access issue where, you know, you're in a rural area or things like that, you may have less options, but we're not necessarily helpless. And so, you know, it might not be exactly what you want, but that doesn't mean you have to take what's right in front of you. And so I think there's a little bit of agency and savvy that kind of goes into seeking a provider, but also as much as you can, just being intentional and curating your everyday wellness experiences as well. That's wonderful. And I um, just want to mention, because I, I, we don't have to get into it here, but part of, you know, there are efforts to increase Black men in healthcare. We have the Black men in white coats, you know, other initiatives, because there's only about a, less than 3% of Black men as medical doctors. Um, and that's just one example. So just as you stated, the chances of you actually being able to have that racial concordance and having, you know, uh, a black woman or a black male or whatever that is for your race, it's going to be extremely low. But the ability to be flexible and, and navigate and look for different options is going to be critical. I also want to highlight one of the other things you said about looking for other avenues. I hear men talk a lot about things like the barbershop and things like that, just conversations. Um, it doesn't have to be this formal setting. Of where therapy takes place. So I think we need to be innovative and creative on how we think about what therapy looks like, which you said is really different from treatment, actual treatment with the psychiatric diagnosis. But therapy can just have a trusted, you know, confidant and friend, someone to talk to either as an individual or group, and just being able to be vulnerable, as you state, as you stated. And I want our attendees to notice that a lot of these men, because people think black men don't get therapy, but a lot of them do. And they're um, promoting it, um, and I think it's healthy. And how you do it and how you come about it is going to be an individual decision. So and I just want to hop in, uh, in addition to what you just said, as far as thinking about therapy and things like that, you don't have to go to therapy to have therapeutic things occur in your life. Uh, and I think those are the things that people can get a little bit confused. Absolutely. I totally agree. I don't know. This time is going. We have a couple questions. I don't know if I start taking questions now if somebody want to jump in. Yeah, can I uh, can I just uh, add a couple of things here? Is that yes. one something we should be aware of is that for the first time the black youth suicide rate exceeds that of white youth, right? So right now the black youth suicide rate is double that of white children, and when you look within black children, the rate for black girls is double that of boys. That's one. Two, we are in the 50th year of the end of the U.S. Public Health Service study at Tuskegee University. A uh, syphilis study at Tuskegee. And being that 50th anniversary, we, we need to acknowledge that and some of the trauma and existence of that. Because in 1972, when it ended, you mentioned about the number of Black men that are in college medical school. The number and percentage of Black men that are currently in medical school has not changed since 1972. Um, I want to put something in the context given time within the form of art so that we can all kind of digest it. If we want to understand what trauma means to us, we can either watch the book movie or read the book Beloved. And if you want to understand how trauma is, then Beloved teaches you that level of which trauma can haunt you. Well, you don't want to watch Beloved, then listen to Billie Holiday, Good Morning Heartache, Sit Down. Well, you don't want to do that? Robert Johnson, I woke up this morning and the blues was standing in my living room like a grown man. <laughs> Baby Suggs is standing on the rock and she's telling Black people, Black men, allow your children to hear you what? Cry. Allow your children to hear your feet stomp and touch the ground free. Allow your children to hear you clap, et cetera. The trauma that we're dealing with in our communities and some of our kids are reaching out to us and crying out to us, is for that reconnection as to who we are. And if we cannot find a way within ourselves to first love one another at a level, which we got to repair, right? Because you think about this, there are only 14% of the United States population of children, Black children, but 30% of the children in foster care are Black children, right? 
And so who's taking care of our children and or why? We're asking ourselves, why are children acting the way they're acting? Well, I'm gonna tell you how they, why they're acting the way that they're acting. We've been giving them SSI and this, that, and the other, tell them that they, and they'll tell you that, hey, they've been telling me I'm crazy or AMH or whatever, IEP, since I was third grade. You're giving them synthetic heroin in the form of ADHD meds or whatever it is, they can't get high enough. And they will tell you that they're telling us this. And when we bring it back to people, right? We can do by zip code, the salt, fat, sugar addiction, by zip code of black school districts, obesity and tie that back to drug, drug interaction in children. And there are black people who are leading these schools and school districts where we can have that conversation. And we wanna have that conversation. What I'm saying is that there has to be a conversation with us when we step aside and understand that white racism is, it is what it is. And we, we had a whole system to protect ourselves, to protect our communities and to restore ourselves within the form of music, art, culture, and those things. And our children are saying, where is it? Where did that go? You know, nobody's beating that tambourine for me. Nobody's beating that drum for me. And we are afraid to do it now because of, you know, political affiliations or whatever it is. But I would just like to say that somebody's got to be baby slugs on the rock. Somebody's got to tell our children what Paul D told Setha. Setha, you are your best self. You are your best self. What our children need to understand is that those whips and those trees that are on their back, we got them, we got the salve to help them, but that's on us. If we sit and wait for other folk to do it, like my great uncles used to say, don't ever let white folk tell you where to buy your bacon. It's always going to be off they haul, out they store, and at their price. And what he meant was that you have to learn to figure out how we're going to take care and love ourselves. And if that's a part of a conversation, if we do a part two of that, because if let a black man tell another black man, man, brother, I love you. We, I tell that my fair brothers and my brothers all the time. But let a black man stand up in a room full of folks and say, I love my woman. I love my children. I mean, you're going to have people looking at you all kind of crazy. Because what are those four words got to do with you as a black man standing there? So if we don't incorporate that kind of language and get to that level of conversation, we won't be able to dismantle the structures that are destroying our children. Um, I want to modernize that with, if you haven't either watched this season of Atlanta on FX with Donald Glover or listened to the new Kendrick Lamar album, uh, you, 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 he touches on all of those themes. Uh, we Cry Together is, a, is a, a, a woman and man arguing, rapping, the kind of battle rapping their argument. And it, it's one of those things that like, for me, just highlights, and he has a he has a song about fatherhood on there as well, and, and kind of raising your child, and and I think to kind of speak to how um, the expect not the expectation the the value of black creativity in that space to kind of describe narrate. Uh, uh, Dr. West went right to the English teacher stuff. He went to Toni Morrison. Uh, you could you could read all of Toni Morrison and, and get all of these lessons, but uh, you can go Beloved or Song of Solomon, which is my favorite, which does a, a very similar you know, kind of similar thing about families and care and what that looks like moving forward and how that imprints on you moving forward. Uh, but, I, but I think our young people have been, I would say they've been telling us this for a while. We've been headed down this path for a while. <laughs> um, and the question is, generationally, what are we going to do about it? Uh, I've often found myself in a space, not just as an educator, but just as a human, um, trying to explain to elders and people of my generation, like, what the life is like for a young person right now. Uh, Philip mentioned, like, you know, some of us met each other when we were 16, 17, 18 years old on this, on the, on the Zoom. And who we, who we were then and what we were experiencing then in the, in the <clears throat> you know, back in the day, <laughs> what, what young people are experiencing now, I couldn't imagine growing up in this time right now with all of the inputs <laughs> and all of the images and all of the things. So we have to first come from a space of listening, right? We gotta, like they've been telling us, like listen to you. They, they've they been yelling at you. They've been telling you in, in the way that they would tell you what was going on with them. And now how do we respond to that? What does that look like? 
And, and I agree, the institutions and the things that we had in the past don't exist in the same way. And they don't exist in the same way for a lot of different reasons. Some of them are, we're just not in the community in the same way. I'll speak from the city of Chicago. Um, you know, kids don't go to school, most kids don't go to school a mile away from their house, right? They don't do things within the neighborhood. They, they go outside of their neighborhood. They travel, they do a lot of things in different places. So a lot of different things happen. They have to interact with different people in different ways, but they also don't have that steadiness that might happen if they just had 10 friends on the block. Uh, that they kind of commune with, that they know, that they grow up with. So the ways communities have changed in certain cities uh, for, for, with intention. Uh, another one of our colleagues from Illinois, David Stovall at UIC, talks about engineered conflict, right? Like, oh, there are systems in place and, thing, and policy decisions that created these circumstances where now we have to react. And we have decisions again on how to react. And I think that's what we've kind of been dealing with and talking about. And, and so I think that idea of how that suicide rate has gone up what young people are telling us, but then also how our art and creativity respond to that and are telling us, you know, how we feel about it and then how what, what we need to do. They're describing some of the things that we're all going through and how we respond to that, uplift that, and then talk to people, be in community with people about that. Yes, man. So profound. Um, and I'm just being mindful, Joseph, because I know you have to leave a little early. I want to give you the opportunity, but just echoing. Um, just the, the, all the conversations and what you're talking about, elevating these conversations and connecting with our children. Um, but one thing you just, you left off on Dwayne was the, basically the, the role, you know, certain roles and certain stakeholders and you mentioned policy. So I wanted to get Dr. West's um, input on this before he, he takes off. So when we think about who the stakeholders right, are when we're re relating to health equities and inequities, the roles that payers play and policymakers play is huge. And both of us have been in that space, you know, and I'm currently in the payer space and I understand what that power is like. And one of the things that we try to push to is putting some of that power back into the hands of the community, right? We need to not just have tokenism at the table, but really to say, we need you to be an active voice at the table to raise their power and their position as it relates to making change. So I know you do a lot of work in the payer space and policy space. So I want you to speak a little more to the importance of that. Um, is there something that we can do to help elevate those conversations? Because that's really where it's at. You know, that's Absolutely. Really mm -hmm. So everybody mark your calendars for June the 10th at the Bleacher Center. We'll be having a conference on Black men's participation in Medicaid, Medicaid space. Particularly, we have been working with the state of Illinois to set aside a particular block of dollars for black male owned businesses to be BEP certified and to create black male owned companies to get the business enterprise practice program. The state has a legislative uh, legislated 20% of the state spend, especially for Medicaid to be BEP. Right now, black men are participating at about 3%. So uh, with that, the reason uh, as a payer and as also as a former payer, we pay claims. We are now getting ready to pilot with uh, two of, uh, with one big major play, payer, an investment in community health centers. Um, uh, it's a two phase investment where uh, one part of that is uh, an investment in, in community infrastructure. With another payer, what we're doing is we're having them train and invest in black men to learn how to be what I call street nurses, formerly incarcerated men, to go out, find and work with other formerly incarcerated men who are high risk, uh, go into those SRO, single room occupancies. And we finally convinced the payers that, you know, without getting into all the language that you and I know about MLRs, HP, you know, all, 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 the, all the actuarials, I've developed an actuarial model that says pay for it now or pay three times for it later. Exactly. Yeah. You're gonna pay for it up front now and invest in them now, or I'll tell you what, you're now contributing to the social, you know, social breakdown. So we will be piloting that with five FQHCs across the city of Chicago. On June the 10th, we are presenting three business cases for black male investment. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're taking that report to the state of what, what of, uh, of, of black male owned businesses. And we'll have two attorneys there who help black, who have all companies get BEP certified. 
and we will be talking about the structure of the Medicaid and, and Medicare dual spend specifically for black men and boys going forward and so in, uh, in, in, in the next two years. So that's June the 10th, more details of that are coming, but it's June 10th at the Bleacher Center downtown and I'll definitely will send you more information about that. You're talking about $30 million a year for the next three years. Wow, that's amazing. And I'm gonna hit you with one more. If you have time, um, I'm gonna hit you with this question someone asked specifically for you, Dr. West, and we're gonna try to get to a few questions, but that way you can uh, do what you need to do. So the question says, in reference to of stress, what are the best ways to cope with stress and maneuver stress in while as a leader in your home? This is asked mm -hmm. by one of our attendees to Dr. West. Yeah, I have to go pick up my own little black man. That's why I got to leave. <laughs> he said, hey, you practice. But, um, and so, you know, I think that there's a couple of things. I mean, you know, I, there are things that I, I've learned to do in my own home in terms of, of quiet. We shut down the house at a certain time. Um, everybody gets kind of in that routine. Um, you know, uh, we do everything, you know, burn incense, have the right kind of music, have the right kind of feel. I think that what you have to do in your house is be intentional and purposeful about that piece, however you find it. I mean, I still burn incense. I still, you know, we, 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 we have meditation music and we shut the house down, all no Wi-Fi and no phones after a certain time in the house. Um, so, so there's that. And then, you know, there's just, it, I would just encourage everybody to be purposeful in finding th that space for, for, for how you love your family, how you love yourself and how you protect your home. That's wonderful. Because we that. still sage and smudge and that, that hey. I do all that. that old, <laughs> the old stuff that all, old folks used to do, there, there's something to it, whether it's ritualistic or what have you, but you have to, you know, you, you respect it, but to each his own, right? But I think that you find a way to, to create that safe healing space in, in your home. And I love how you say that. And I'm a big fan of that as well, just proponent of creating that healing space and what that means for you um, and what you create in your home, the atmosphere, smells, lighting, all of that. Um, tea was a thing of mine, aromatherapy. So those are all the things that I tap into for my wellness as well. So I think another thing that you said that's important is thinking outside of the box of what wellness looks like, you know, and creating that healthy space. So I appreciate you answering that question. And I hopefully um, to our attendee that asked that, thank you for the question. Um, we have a couple more questions. If you guys are ready, we'll try to get to them. Um, this first one is saying nearly one in three black men are threatened by imprisonment and nearly half of black women currently have a family or extended family member who is in prison. While understanding the impact the criminal justice system has on the health of the incarcerated group, the two third of black men and boys are not incarcerated and have significant gaps in service delivery and health deficits for their quality of life needs. As a parent, I am routinely having to have discussions with my preteen son that black men in jail are not a right, not right fit puzzle pieces. Um, we kind of alluded to that, but someone want to answer and jump in on that one? I'll, I guess that fits a little more squarely in my wheelhouse. Um, I, I'll, I'll address the last part of that about Black men being right fit. This is, uh, we, we aren't right fit by our definition, but by society's definition, we are right fit. And that's the way it's always been. Uh, we talk about mass incarceration like it's a recent thing. The disproportionate rate of incarceration of black men has been what it what it is uh, since the fall of um, slavery, right? Once we went into uh, once we entered into um, convict leasing, that's when a disproportionate rate. That's when the real mass incarceration, real mass incarceration of black folks began. Mass incarceration is so high now that it's actually we're seeing some reversals. In those, in those trends uh, where white men compared to black men over the last 15 years, uh, the gap has closed ever so slightly um, in the disproportionate rate with rural people, rural white people going to prison and jail at a very high rate. 
So it is right fit by America. We've been right fit by America in the constitution from us being three fifths of a human. And uh, there's a great book by uh, uh, Khalil Gibran Muhammad called Condem Condemnation of Blackness that traces the historical roots of this as well. But that's all to say we didn't get here by accident either. I actually study uh, not just incarceration, but where we build prisons and why we build them. A lot of people think that we uh, incarcerated a whole bunch of folks and then um, uh, it was overcrowding and that's why we built, built jails and prisons. We actually did the opposite, right? We built our way into mass incarceration. We built our way into, uh, before we have this current health crisis, where uh, uh, the prison is a perfect engine to propagate COVID. Before that, the prison was being used to propagate Hep C and other uh, forms of infectious disease, including HIV and AIDS. So the prison actually helped uh, helped uh, push out or expand, really expand HIV and AIDS, the spread of HIV and AIDS. Um, and that's for a number of reasons, right? But we've, this is by, and I know I'm pointing, I seem to be pointing towards more problems, but I'm not. There was a lot of intentionality. It took a lot of effort for us to get to where we are today, right? Um, and we didn't even question why we were doing it. We thought these were bad people that needed to be put in a place uh, and someplace away from us, right? And these are family members. Uh, these are family members. The flip side of this is, um, you know, I mentioned that eight or nine out of 10 black folks know someone in jail or prison or have a loved one that's been incarcerated. Uh, there are nearly half a million corrections officers and there are one million, nearly one million police officers. Uh, and 35% of all corrections officers are black and 12% of all police officers are black. So that means one in two black people know someone who's either a police officer or a corrections officer. So when you have all of these things going on in terms of health issues, uh, what, spread, what spread COVID actually, the spread of COVID into facilities was caused by the black corrections officers leaving their black communities where COVID was being spread, taking it into the prison. I have a paper that shows this last year. Uh, corrections officers brought COVID into the prison, right? Not the other way around. It started with them and then it propagated back out. So when you have issue, this is these things are very complex. These problems are very complex, but sometimes the solution is just easy, right? Give, give folks access to health care, give them better health care. Uh, and, and actually, if we can, I, I think Dr. Murray had it right. If we can start redefining wellness and health uh, and healthy behaviors and emphasizing that as a cultural response, I think Dr. West is right too. I'm gonna see you, Joe, take care, man. Um, I, I think this is right. I think, I think uh, Dwayne's, Dwayne's right about this too. If we have a cultural response that goes beyond just what individuals can do, but if we think about this as ways um, that we can respond just by trying to do better, right? And there's a lot of different ways we can do better. There is intentionality to make things this bad. We're gonna have to have an equal, uh, an equal amount of intentionality to, to correct for these things. Absolutely. And like you said, when we're talking about um, institutions and things been actually they're designed to they're working as design. Like you said, I think a lot of times we thought it was like some kind of accident or it or wasn't really meant to be that way. But a lot of the work I do in health equity is really, you know, as we start to unpack and, and talk about the root causes of things, it really was designed It's working as design. And so how do we change institutions? Well, people make up institutions. So, you know, starting to have those conversations. So I want to get some more of these questions asked and maybe I'll um, put this over to Dr. Murray. It says, good evening, you all. Being a young man that deal with so much trauma living in the inner city of Chicago, 
what would you recommend on how to deal with severe social society PTSD? All right, so when it comes to, I'm just gonna address PTSD just as a general thing. So PTSD, for those who don't know, I mean, it's basically a reaction after a traumatic event. Trauma is usually defined as something to where your life is at risk. Um, in a lot of situations, uh, there are big T traumas. So that's, you know, whether it's gun violence, whether it's abuse, things like that. And there are little T traumas that are kind of really, unfortunately, some of the things that we can uh, experience daily. Uh, Dr. Davis referenced it earlier, but some of what we call adverse childhood experiences, those can build up. There's a whole large study on the, CB, the CDC. Basically, if you Google adverse childhood, childhood experiences, you can find a lot of information. But basically, if messed up stuff happens to you early in life, it can throw you off track. It's not something that we're surprised to hear, but that's kind of how it can go. So when it comes to looking at, so there's traumatic experiences and then there's post-traumatic stress disorder. One is something that happens to us, one is a diagnosis. So I want to put those in two different things. If we're talking about post-traumatic stress disorder, I'm talking meets criteria, goes with what's in the books, that's something that needs to be treated by a professional. Uh, when it comes to ways to deal with trauma, a big part of treating trauma and things like that has to do with what we call psychoeducation, which is understanding what's happening to you both practically and within your mind. And also uh, what we call a narrative, which is getting back to the day-to-day -day activities and things feeling more normal. The biggest thing that we wanna do if somebody has experienced trauma, no matter what that may be, is get you back to a point where you feel safe. Um, and that can be very hard to do depending on your day to day. But if you've heard of something called the fight or flight response, it's something that keeps us safe. Historically, way, way, way back when it would keep us safe from dinosaurs and predators and things like that. Now it can keep us safe from a car that's coming across the street or, you know, seeing the wrong folks in the neighborhood. <laughs> Either way, it can inform what we do. And so after you're outside of the threat, your body should calm down. But if your body is still going, that means it has the right response for the wrong situation. And so a lot of what we do is try to put things back in order so that way people can go on about their day. The way I like to explain it to folks is it's not a hardware problem, it's a software problem, you know, where you're kind of having the wrong response to what's going on. So I would say, uh, generally speaking, what you should do is as much as possible. And I understand this can be very difficult for folks, but kind of involving yourself as much as possible in a daily routine, recognizing when you start to feel some of those things, when you start to feel a little bit sweaty, start to feel a bit anxious, start to feel that heart rate going up. In those situations, if you can either change your surroundings or put something around you that feels safe, whether it's people, places, or things, whether it's somebody that you have that you can check with, I think those are ways to do it as far as generally speaking. Um, when it comes to something that's beyond that, that's something that requires more treatment. What I'm going to do is put uh, some resources in the uh, chat for everyone. One is gonna be for the American Psychiatric Association. They have kind of a one pager on trauma. Uh, the expert that they asked, it is a picture of an old white man, but I promise you the information is good. Uh, it can be helpful as far as guiding things. And we've talked about access to care and things like that. And I understand everybody can't just go out and get a therapist or things like that. Uh, if you have a primary care doctor, they can help with resources that are local to you. But also there's an organization called NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And they do a lot of, I guess you could say community-based programming and things like that, where it's not necessarily attached to doctors, hospitals, or things like that. And it's more of a peer type of organization. So I'm gonna put those links uh, in the chat to everyone now, and you can take a peek there. Thank you, Dr. Phil. And that was my trying to bust them out. That's my baby brother. I have three brothers in Chicago. Uh, my oldest brother is here in Minnesota. And so um, I think we, you know, man, when you talk about the ACEs and, and family and what you grew up in, sometimes it's just amazing what you've been able to, to work through and get through. But um, thank you, baby bro, for being here and for asking that question. Thank you, Dr. Phil. <laughs> and one other thing I want to say is for a lot of folks, it's powerful just being able to name what's happening to you. Exactly. I think yeah. you that, then you know, like, okay, so now that I know what it is, there's a way to work on it. Because I think a lot of times what really throws things off is people are just reacting and experiencing and have no idea what's there. And it just reinforces these feelings of hopelessness that trauma, unfortunately, puts in us. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. And I just, I think this is more of a comment. Someone said, be aware of the commission on the social status of black men and boys, Representative Frederica Wilson. Um, and we're getting close to time, man. It's, it's just so much. I know we had talked about potential questions we would talk about. We ain't even got to half them, but I think what needed to be said was said, right? In some ways it was, and it was even uh, better than I could uh, imagine. But I want to maybe end, just have everybody go around um, and kind of give their final thoughts, kind of take home points, what you want to lead the people with. I would definitely be open to a part two. I know there were some things that Joe talked about unpacking a little bit more. I think it would be wonderful to do that. Uh, let's start with you, Dwayne, and we'll go around with final thoughts. You're always calling on me first. I feel like I'm getting picked on by the teacher, but that's all right. That's all right, Tamiko. I, I got you. I got you. Um, so it, it came up multiple times about the lack of representation inside of the spaces and, and basically it's a workforce development or a pipeline issue and, and i think all of us as probably mentors to people in our you know various professions uh people that teach people you know whether that's on you know at the at the uh, secondary post-secondary university or graduate level um, but I think we think about the root cause of that problem and it starts with, I'm, I'm going to just cake for my work right here. It starts with like, what are we doing? Like I thought about Reach Out and Read. I don't know if people know about Reach Out and Read. It's an organization around the country that tries to like get books, pediatrician to me, Dr. Foster of course knows, right? Get books to parents and wellness visits for babies, you know, birth and talk about the importance of reading to your child. And I, I reach out to them and talk to them and say, the community literacy is probably one of the most important things and inside of community literacy is science literacy. This is like we don't understand why masks are important or how viruses spread. Um, civic literacy, understanding how we can have impact and what we can do. And then just like reading and loving art and finding stories to speak to you and finding yourself in those stories and encouraging your imagination. Right. So I, I think all of these things, how these things are represented. The, the kinds of images that we put in front of our young people, the kind of images we put in front of our, our young men and our boys, um, and how, how we talk to them about that and what that means. One of the questions in the Q&A that I answered, I typed, but it was just how you deal with stress and how do you cope with stress? And, and that came up early and even John asked that question, like, I hope we kind of get into that. And we, some of we say exercise and meditation, and we say that as if everybody knows how to do it or knows what to do. And I think one of the most important things that I learned as an educator is you have to teach people how to ask questions to get help, right? Like you gotta actually talk to people. And an example I give, and I'll end on this little anecdote, which is if you want me to help me with your paper, you can't just throw your paper in front of me and say, I need help with this. You gotta tell me specifically what you had trouble with. I mean, you gotta kind of understand the assignment. And I always explain it and can you think about doctors in that way. And I said, when you go to the doctor, they ask you a battery of questions. They interrogate you so they can figure out what your symptoms are so then they can help you. I said, I go to the doctor and list everything that's happened to me so they don't have to ask me any questions. <laughs> like I started here, here's how I felt two days ago, here's how I felt this morning, here's how I feel right now, and here are all the things that are happening with me. So now I can shorten the distance, but I'm aware of who I am and where I am and what I need to do in order to get help. So I think that's just the lesson is that the kinds of things you want to talk to, and this is intergenerational, it's everybody, that communication, things that shouldn't be said and things you say out loud. Here's how I'm feeling. <laughs> Here's what's going on with me. Here's what I need help with. All right, teach people how to have those conversations, to identify those things, be self-aware, because then if they can articulate it, even at the youngest ages, they can figure out, hopefully, be in a trusting relationship with somebody where somebody can get them some help. So that, that's, that's, where I, that's where I end and, and, and I'm appreciative of this conversation. Absolutely. And, and the health literacy, you mentioned that, but that piece in particular is huge when we're talking about disparities, you know, the ability to understand and just being really careful. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to really do these wellness webinars, because we tend to speak to each other a lot as colleagues, you know, we'll hold these academic, you know, webinars and seminars and we'll speak the fancy language and how do we tap in and bring our, the community as part of conversation and have the conversation in a way that people can actually understand it, you know? So I wanted this to be, and certainly, you know, the academias are welcome, but I wanted it to be more of a public facing, community facing space to have these conversations, you know, because literacy is a big part of that. 
And if people don't know how to ask the questions, as you stated, you know, they're not going to get the answer or not even know what to ask for. So I appreciate you bringing that in as an educator and um, how that relates to health. So who, who wants to go next? Uh, Phil, do you want to jump in and give your yeah, final thoughts? I, think so. I, think so. I mean, I think it's interesting going with the doctor example, because I see a lot of people who either aren't able to articulate why they're there or uh, sometimes they're not the reason they're there. Um, and so what I would say is, even if you don't have the exact answer figured out, even if you don't know exactly what's wrong, but you know something's wrong, uh, I would say not only go to the places that you think help is being offered, but keep showing up until you get what you need. Uh, I think a lot of times, and I will admit that is tough and can take a different type of resilience because I think a lot of times, I'm not going to speak for everybody's experience as a Black man, but in mine, you can be reminded that certain spaces aren't designated for you. Um, and so it can take, it can be revolutionary to say, if this space is for me or not, I still need some things. So I'm just going to, you know, do my best to hang out until they come my way. Uh, and I think also we can get easily caught up in the very real kind of structural and just large issues that are facing all of us. And when you do that, it can absolutely become overwhelming, but you also got to live your day to day. You know, whether it's school, whether it's work, whether it's family, whether it's spouses, whatever it may be. And so with that, I guess my thing is the same way you curate your social media feed, you figure out who you follow, who you don't follow. Uh, the same way I would encourage you to find those people in your life that help you reaffirm that safety. Um, the way that it goes, not just within America, well, within America, and so therefore in our community, you kind of get a one size fits all approach. Uh, and even as we're talking this evening, I'm mindful that we're talking about a very specific type of manhood, masculinity and everything else. And there's not a lot of room within that. And so that's why, you know, I would encourage you to give yourself permission, not that you need everybody to like you, not that you need, you know, an entire neighborhood, but just one or two folks that you feel safe enough to say, hey, here's what's going on, as Dr. Davis referenced, to feel safe enough to say something's not quite right, and then build from there. And I think that's really how you deal with these big things that are going on by taking the small steps locally. Amen. Dr. Eason, sorry, we, what's your final thoughts? Um, I'm going to make it real brief. Uh, I think there are a lot of things individual, there's a lot of different strategies individuals can do, but I think we just need more conversations like this. Uh, there's a lot of folks with the title doctor on here, but all of us come at this uh, very important issue with, uh, none of us are coming at this issue from the same perspective. And I think, uh, if we if we're going to be uh, if we're going to be able to intervene uh, and make serious changes, it's going to come from folks like us who have these positions of authority who can potentially make some changes. Uh, that's that's where I'd like to end. Thank you for inviting me on this panel. Thanks, Dr. Murray, uh, for for all your wisdom and Dwayne. Uh, Thank you for uh, being kind to me during this time. I wanna thank you all. Um, this was a really rich discussion. And as you stated, I think just being able to really emphasize the fact when people thought they were, we were talking about health and wellness, like, oh, you got a teacher, you got a professor, you got a, well, remembering that's changing the narrative of what creates health and remembering that at least 80% of health takes place out of the healthcare system. So it shouldn't just be the doctors and nurses and healthcare providers talking about health. It should be housing, transportation, your educators, you know, your professors, all of that. So everyone plays a role. I want to thank everybody. Um, thank all the attendees. Hopefully we'll be continuing to have these conversations. As Dr. Eason said, in the meantime, continue to build each other up, um, stay well, and God bless everybody. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. -bye.